Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and get us started. Again, as I mentioned, I'm Dr. Nika White, and this is the Intentional Conversations vodcast. We do this every Friday from 11 to 12 noon Eastern Standard Time, and it's just an opportunity for us to intersect conversations of diversity, equity, and inclusion with leadership and business. So, so we always like to make sure that we are addressing what's top of mind for people, um, and so I look forward to today's conversation. I am being supported today by members of my team, including producers, Natasha Portz Kova, who is a DEI manager with um, NWC, as well as Lindsay Morton, our DEI coordinator, and then Lauren Decay, another DEI manager, is also assisting with backstage um, as well. So I want you to turn your attention, of course, to the screen. I'm going to take you through a couple um, slides. The next one is really just to let you know who's coming up next week. And so next week, I'm going to be hosting along with Natasha, and I'm so excited for that opportunity. And we're going to have Joe Gertstad that's going to be sharing with us. And in that intentional conversation, we're going to cover topics related to inclusion, how we allow it in, how we respond to the difference we create, and how we utilize it, and how our actions and reactions to it can shape our personal and professional networks. And so if you don't know Joe, look him up. You're in for a treat next Friday, February 12th. Again, at the end of today, each of you that are registered for today's session, you will receive an email that will not only have the replay um, link to today's session, but it will also have a link for you to go ahead and register for next week's session. So go to the next slide for me, please, Natasha. And then the week after that, we also have another wonderful host on Friday, February 19th, and that's Sean Harvey. I'm really looking forward to that conversation. He has a really unique approach to this space of diversity, equity, and inclusion. We're going to be talking about developing the next generation of soul-inspired bridge builders, facilitators, and leaders equipped to form authentic and purpose-driven communities. And so I love the work that he's doing. It has such a fresh and new approach, and I think that we all can gain value by hearing from Sean Harvey. So I look forward to him joining us on February 19th. Now, it does me great pleasure to introduce a friend of mine. I know that you probably say, you say this every week, Nika, but yes, I love the fact that so many of my network, not only are they astute practitioners, but they're also friends of mine most often. And um, I just find it fit to continue to build and cultivate those relationships. And this is one of those cases. And so I'm going to formally introduce Charles Weathers, and then I'm gonna allow him just to come forward and get engaged in the conversation and tell us something about himself that we would not necessarily read in his bio. So here's a little bit about Charles my friend. He is the founder of the Weathers Group, a management consulting firm focused on organizational development, specializing in helping leaders and teams learn, connect, and perform. As the founder of the Weathers Group, Charles captivates audiences with contagious energy. I know this to be true because I've seen it firsthand. Insight as well as humor. He's a recognized authority on leadership and organizational effectiveness, and he has become known for his strategic intellect and skillful facilitation style. Welcome, my friend, Charles. How are you today? I'm well, my friend. How are you today? Good to be here with you. I am so glad that you are here with me. I always say that it makes us feel seen, valued, and heard when our guests say yes to our invite. And so I, I'm just so appreciative of your willingness to share with this community today. So I promised the audience that, you know, while I would read your accolades and your bio, but still we want to get an opportunity to get to know Charles a bit more personally. And so tell us what we do not know about you from reading your bio. What is your story? Here's my story, which you do not know about me. A couple things. Number one, I am a dog owner, loving my dog, and my dog is special to me. And what kind of dog? She, she's a dog we got from the pound, so to speak. Yeah. And, uh -huh. and, and we think she's a Staffordshire Terrier, but we're not really sure. But she's a beautiful dog. That's what she is. <laughs> <laughs> she's a beautiful dog. Look, it works for me. <laughs> but yeah, she's a, she's a Terrier, and uh, and we just love her, and she just brings joy to the house and to this family. Uh, so you wouldn't know that about me. Also, uh, I have gotten into meditation, Nika. In the last year or so, I have really begun to practice meditation, and that has done wonders for me, both physically, mentally, and spiritually. And uh, I don't know how I ever live without meditating. Uh, yeah. in being a parent and, and, a, and a spouse, you know, life is just good. Here are my three A's for life. You won't see this in my bio. My three A's are authenticity, awareness, and acceptance. That's mm -hmm. how I live. And, and I feel that if you live authentically, if you practice healthy self-awareness and just accept things as they are and quit trying to force and change things that aren't meant to change, you might find some peace. 
That's me. You're speaking my language. I love that. And I love that you have found meditation as part of, of this journey of self-care because that's become so important these days. Yeah. Um, did you find that you gravitated towards something different as part of your self-care regimen because of all that was going on in society and you needed maybe to have additional outlet or was it just something you've always been interested in? You know, I, I've been interested in it for a while, but I tell you, 2020 for me just put me in a space where, like others probably, I had to just reassess life, reassess myself. I pushed the pause button. I, Nika, I pushed the pause button. Uh, mm -hmm. I was fortunate enough where we made it through 2020. Uh, we were doing what we had to do. But I said, you know what? Listen to people saying, I want to go back. want to go back to the way it was. Nika, I don't want to go back. I, mm -hmm. I made a conscious decision. There were things about my life prior to March 2020, I will not accept back anymore. So mm -hmm. I took that time to really recreate and shape my life in a way I had never done before. I love that, Charles. I love that. So you, I'm going to go back to your three A's because they were really powerful. Authenticity, mm -hmm. awareness, and acceptance. Yes. And so I'm sure we're going to talk about all three, but I want to deal with the awareness right now because I happen to know that you truly believe that leaders must have a healthy level of self-awareness, particularly mm -hmm. to be effective, inclusion-minded leaders and operate in the space of DEI. So let's unpack that a little bit. Sure, sure. I think that self-awareness is our strength, is our superpower. Mm -hmm. One of the things that I recognize is, watch this, I know my strengths and I know my weaknesses. Yes. And though I consider myself a strength-based leader, what I've done, my self-awareness, Nika, has allowed me to surround myself with people who know what I don't. There's an example right there. Yeah. I, I surround myself, I am not threatened by the genius and brilliance of my team. <laughs> I don't need to know everything. So my self-awareness, I know when to let go I know when to allow somebody else to do it. Watch this. As a leader, I know when to get out the way. Yeah. That is so critical. You know when to get out of the way. And I find that in this space, as practitioners in this space, mm -hmm. uh, that's part of really the complexity of our work is to help clients realize when they need to get out of their own way so that's that right. they can effectively move towards sustainable change and impact. And so I love the fact that you brought to the conversation the significance of, and I'm using your words here because I know that you, you, you shared this as we were prepping for today, creating space for understanding. Creating space for understanding, not necessarily agreement, but understanding. So I want you to talk about that because I know that really is something that's important to, to the, your messaging platform. Yes, it is. Yes, it is. So here's a couple of things. That for the folks who are listening to us, I suggest you write these four words down. Understanding, agreement, acceptance, and acknowledgement. Mm. Write those words down. Those are four different paradigms. So, so Nika, particularly, let's even think about the work of DE&I. Many of us cannot find a space or a path to grow and change and evolve because we walk into a room with the mandate of agreement. We are not walking out of the room until Nika agrees with me on X or Y or Z. What I found is if you walk into the room with understanding, Charles and Anika at the, st and Nika at the start may not agree. We may not agree. But if we seek understanding, agreement may be down the pathway. Yes. Think, think yeah. about it for a second. There are people who we know, who we love, who we're related to. We may be married to them. There's some things we're never going to agree on. Okay, let's start with understanding. I love it. Understanding is so critical. And one of the posts that I recently um, placed on social media um, was about that also um, acceptance doesn't mean agreement. And yes, if we seek to understand first, I love the fact that you were able to communicate that maybe agreement could be in the future. But we have to also realize that sometimes agreement, we may not even reach that place at all. Yeah. And that's okay, too, in some regards, you know, I think it's about also being able to coexist with the fact that two individuals or multiple individuals could perhaps just not see eye to eye. Right. And, but how do we continue to at least expose ourselves to those conversations so that we can grow better to be better? Right. I want to go back to the self-awareness conversation because we have a poll that I now want to bring up for this audience to participate in. Right. And because we've expressed how important self-awareness is, I want to give this audience a chance to just address how would you rate your own self-awareness on a scale of one to five? Because I agree with you, self-awareness is critical. And by the way, as our audience is participating in this poll, just also want to acknowledge our live Facebook audience as well. We always want to make sure those individuals do not feel left out. Um, please feel free to share your comments. And we are bringing that into the conversation as well. And so, uh, yes, I, I want to go to the next question now. Sure. A company has the strategies the manuals, the policies, the plans, the objectives, but leadership does not believe in or own the work. Mm. 
how can this be so harmful and toxic to organizations that are really trying to move the needle from a DEI perspective? It gives a false sense of accomplishment. It gives a yeah. false sense of progress. We confuse activity with accomplishment, Nika. Yeah. And what happens is, you know what? I'll create the manual. I'll create the policy. I'll create a new process. We'll do a DEI statement. We'll put it on the website. Okay, check that box. We're done. No, we're not done. That's good and that needs to be done. But that's an activity. That's what I call an output. We're looking for outcomes. Your staff and your team, they want outcomes. They want to see changes in attitudes, knowledge, skills, behaviors, and conditions. That's what they want. And so as leaders, we must recognize that we can't solve a people problem by changing a policy. We got to deal with people. That's right. People centric is, is so important to this work. And I love the fact that you're amplifying um, that activity does not necessarily equate to accomplishment. I often say activity is not the same as impact. Mm -hmm. and, and you're right. You know, we have to make sure that we're, we're really peeling back all the layers and we're identifying the root causes of issues that could be compromising inclusion within work environments and, and solving for it in that regard. We can't put a bandaid on this. And so I love that you approach this work with a, a depth of clarity around the need to really get to the crux of the matter. So, Nika, let me, let me if I can. Yes. What, what, what I do, thank you for saying it, because one of the things that I believe that we do, and I know you do this as well, I spend time working with the individual leader with self-awareness and understanding and self-reflection, because what will happen is often they'll say things like this. I'm a good person. There's a lot of good people causing yeah. harm in the workplace. Right. Me, again, for those that didn't hear it, there's a lot of good people causing harm in the workplace because of their lack of self-awareness. Yes. So we got to spend time with leaders having those one-on-one -on -one conversations. And quite frankly, sometimes leaders don't have the space to be vulnerable. They've never been vulnerable before. And sometimes it's hard to admit, I don't know. I, I teach folks, I don't know. Those three words are beautiful words because competency is not just measured by what you don't know. It's measured by your ability and willingness to acknowledge what you don't. Yes, that's so true. That's so true. And I think that sometimes leaders, they don't give themselves permission to be forthcoming and saying, you know what, I I, I don't know, we're learning together. Yep. And, and I think that that comes from a place where they perceive it as weakness, but I think that it's a place of strength and it allows people to really be able to, to give themselves permission to also be on this learning journey rather than having to put on a facade of knowing it all and figuring it out. Right. So I love that. I love that. That is that is key. So elaborate on the need for managers and leaders to sit in a space in their discomfort rather than just trying to have this knee jerk reaction to how in which to engage in this work of DEI. Because I see that a lot and you're shaking your head. So I sense you see it a lot, too. <laughs> OK, so, so you know me. Here's my here's my three D's that I deal with. We have three A's. And now we have another. We have three D's. OK, bring them on. Up. <laughs> bring them on up. What people do. They dismiss it, discount it or disregard it. Oh, yeah. When, 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 think about it. We, re, I want to do the work. I'm going to do the work of DEI, and then we reach that point of discomfort because it's coming. By the way, it's going to come. Oh, yes, yes. Charles, you didn't tell me this. Nika, did you? <laughs> <laughs> oh, th this yeah. hurt. And, and then we yeah. either start to dismiss it. Well, it's not that bad. We disregard it, try to ignore it, or just discount it. Yeah. We, have to, we have to acknowledge that that's the time that we engage. We have to sit with that discomfort. Now, here's the thing, though, Nika. This is very important. People have associated and conflated uncomfortable with unsafe. Oh, that's so true. That's good. That's good. They're not the same. Yeah. So we have to let leaders know during this DEI journey, it's going to get uncomfortable, but that does not mean your safety is threatened. Yeah. And if you understand that, that gives them kind of the strength. Okay, I can push through this. And sometimes we have to say, you're okay. It's okay. You're going to be okay. Because it's, they, they've never been uncomfortable like that before. No, I love it. I love it. Sit with the discomfort. And yeah. And and I think that even while they're sitting with the discomfort, that doesn't mean to just sit idle. It means to continue to expose yourself with new information, new learning, so that while you're on that journey of really being comfortable with, with the discomfort, you still can be feeding yourself the knowledge needed to open up your horizon and your intellect about this work and, and your perspective. And so, yeah, that's that's really that's really critical. Yeah. Can you I know, if, that? Oh, I'm sorry. No, go ahead, Charles, please. Quick example. There was a leader I was working with. Uh, she was in a space of discomfort and, and really challenging, and nobody could understand what's going on. Started talking to her and engaging and developing this, again, creating a space for understanding. Come to find out what she had realized through her DNI journey that many of the things that her parents and her family taught her in her hometown were not necessarily true. 
<laughs> she had been, and she's, these are her words. She goes, Charles, I was conditioned and didn't even know I was conditioned. Wow, she, said, yeah. she said, and this has been really uncomfortable for me because now I'm questioning things that my family taught me. She goes, that really wasn't the truth. That wasn't right. And she's like, and she's troubled with that. And that's a whole nother level of an epiphany and an eye opening where you would have just said, well, she doesn't want to do the work. No, she wanted to do the work, but she recognized that personally there was some vexing or conviction there that she was not prepared for. Yeah. You know what, Charles, that reminds me, one of the things that I often share with audiences is that resistance is often a lack of clarity. And yeah. we sometimes assume that that resistance is because people are coming from a place where they want to remain um, you know, ignorant about, about the broad context of diversity, equity, and inclusion in theory and practice, or that they, they, they want to um, you know, continue to perpetuate oppression or, or bigotry. And that's not always the case. They're probably uncomfortable because there's a lack of clarity, which means they stay in their bubble and they're not willing to just engage in a way that allows um, others to be able to help support them on that learning journey. That's right. I so, no, I know that's awesome. So I want to give um, a little bit of, of credence to the survey or the poll question that I asked this audience to participate in. And again, the question was, how would you rate your self awareness on a scale of one to five? And our audience here, um, what's leading is 42 percent with four. And so um, we have 32% at three and then 26% at five. And so I, I would say that this audience is doing relatively well in terms of self-awareness based upon their own account, <laughs> which is great. I know, which is great, which is great. Um, so something that's coming up for me, and I'm sure you've seen this as well, um, over the past you know, 12 or so months, this space, this discipline of DEI has, um, has been pronounced in terms of it's gained some additional credibility because people are now seeing the need for it. And last year, 2020, chief diversity officer was the number one C-suite role that was being posted and filled across organizations all over the globe. And so we know that it's gaining a level of, of, of significance that we have not seen historically. Um, and so people are trying to get into this space. They're trying to really navigate into the space because they, there's multiple motivators. But I think that they really see it as now it's on their radar as a career path. Mm -hmm. And so far, a lot of what we've talked about has not been necessarily the, the glamorous side of this work. I mean, you know, I always say that we do this work, most people, because they're really passionate about it. They have deep convictions for the work. Yeah. And, um, and passion alone, let me just clarify, passion alone is not what it's not what's going to make you an astute or effective practitioner necessarily. It has to be coupled with strategy and, and your own self-awareness and all the things we've already talked about. Mm -hmm. But I just want to give you an opportunity, Charles, to um, you know, react to this notion of this, this huge influx of people wanting to get into this space and what you would want them to know as they really consider that as a potential career path. Wow. Yes, I think everybody thinks it's like, oh, this is great. I'm jumping on and I want to be a part of this craze now. And it's hard work. <laughs> it's hard work. <laughs> you know, uh, I, I respect and appreciate the fact that people want to choose this as a career path. Yeah. And like like you, Nika, we've been doing this long enough and deep enough where we are protective of this work. I'm going to say I'm protective of this work. I and, as well. And, and what I mean by being protective of this work, um, I. If people ask me again, I'm up front with them, but I also let them know if you're not going to do this and do this right way, leave it alone. You can cause more harm than good. And, yeah. and what I mean by that is, you know, people jump on the bandwagon, so to speak. Folks, you can't read, you know, Dr. Kendi's book and be a DEI expert the next week. I mean, I mean again, it, it's <laughs> that, a book. that point. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> it, it's, a, it's a great book. I'm not, you know, you get that point. Yeah. But I, I read that book and now I'm a DEI consultant. Again, no disrespect to anybody, but you got to put the work in. You got, you got to put the work in. There's a body of knowledge affiliated with this work. Yes. There's a body of knowledge affiliated with this work. There's research affiliated with this work. And if we're going to do this work, we need to be professionals in this field. And, and, profesh and professionals have the competency and the character to know what they're doing and do it the right way. That would be my advice if you want to come into this field. No, I love it. Also, what I'd recommend is this, and this is very important. Know what your values are before you dare say you are a DEI consultant. This is why it's important. Our values, we at our company define values as non-negotiable principles we will not compromise that guide our decision making. Mm -hmm. Non-negotiable principles we will not compromise that guide our decision making. So, Nika, I don't care how much money you offer us, how much fame, how much fortune, notoriety. I get to sit at the head table. There's certain things we are not going to do. 
Yeah. This is important to know as a DEI consultant, because I'm going to just be real with you. Sometimes people will call you in to do work at a surface level to check a box and say, we did that DEI and I think. Mm-hmm. And you got to be able to say, Mm-mm, that, that ain't it. Yeah. I mean, we're not going to do this and do it the right way. You got to know what you'll say yes to and what you'll say no to. Does that resonate with you at all, Nika? Oh, my gosh. One hundred percent. You know, I often share that, you know, as, as this, you know, during the season, there's so many practitioners that are being inundated with um, new potential client partnership opportunities. And, you know, as they are vetting us, we're vetting them as well, because we're not necessarily a one stop shop for everyone. And, and we're clear about that. We believe in meeting, you know, clients where they are within the continuum of diversity, equity and inclusion. But a tall tale sign for us that we're going to be an effective partner for those clients is really getting a, a clear sense of of the commitment to being on a journey of really DEI transformative change, you know. Yep. And so and you, you can sense that when you're asking your, your questions as you are really, you know, courting each other. And so, you know, I'm sure like you, we're fortunate to be in a space where we can be selective about those that we say yes and no to. And I take great pride in that as a founder of, of my firm, because, again, one of the reasons that I was motivated to even and um, begin to do this work from an entrepreneurship perspective outside of doing this indirectly within an organization is because I do have strong convictions about this work. And I want to align with clients that are going to respect the craft, the trait, the expertise, the learning. It's not to say we're always going to agree on the how, but I at least need to know that there is a commitment to fully being aware of what the considerations need to be that's top of mind as we're navigating this together. Yes, yes, yes. You know, yeah. you- you and I were talking about readiness, right? And yes. It reminded me of that now because what, 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 and again, I know you have this as well. We have a series of questions. As you said, we get called and people interview us, but we also interview them. And we literally have an interview sheet. We interview our clients. Yes. And because there, there are three things, there are a few things, but there are three at the top that we're looking for. We're looking for number one, is this a priority? Yes. Are, they, are they willing and are they teachable? The, yeah. Those three things for us, like that falls under that commitment you're talking about. Is this but, a priority? Is there a willingness to be engaged and are you teachable? And, and we are very clear about that because so I, what I would tell any new practitioner or somebody coming up in the field, have your set of questions that you're going to ask to help you assess if this work, if you and the f- folks work to, well together. You know, there might be a group that I don't work well with, but Nika does. Nika works well with Charles. You know, that, that's very possible. It doesn't mean anybody's right or wrong. It just didn't seem to click for one of us. And that's OK. But without those questions, you'll never know it. Absolutely. I love that. And so you mentioned organizational readiness. I think that's also an important step that sometimes organizations don't take the time to think intently about before they start to engage in this work. Yep. And, and you know, we use a spectrum tool and it's kind of 12 dimensions of DEI work. And we talk about each one of those dimensions. And really what we're getting those key stakeholders to do is to think about, do you want to lead in this in this capacity around DEI within your industry? Do you want to align? Which is, you know, we're not going to be an early adopter, but I want to kind of at least be tracking with where others are or do you want to lag and then what does that mean for each of them and it never fails of course most people always say we want to lead this is important for us well let me tell you what leading at an exemplary level looks like Hmm. let me help you count the cost and that readiness conversation it's not to say that my expectations for everybody to be already at you know 180 day one but if that's your north star and where you want to be then the way in which i'm going to coach and help partner with you to get on that journey is going to be with that in mind so if you start to introduce something that's not within the mindset of what leaders do, mm-hmm. then I, we're going to have a conversation about it. And I'm going to remind you what you said you wanted, you know? <laughs> <laughs> that's right. Nika, have you found in your work that if people do say, Nika, I just want to align at this point or maybe laggard, is there still work to do at that level as well? You know what? Yes. And I appreciate that. And I give clients permission to kind of own that if that's where they feel like they need to be at that point in time. I always say it's about progress, not perfection. Right. right. I, I have no issues working with clients that are at ground zero. As mm-hmm. long as, again, those those points that you brought up, they're teachable, they're willing. We can't conquer Rome overnight and in a day. We need to make sure that we are being very methodical about how in which we engage in this work. There is a process to it. Mm-hmm. But um you know, it's 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 about again, as you said, are we willing? Are we are we able to really prioritize this in a way that's going to allow our actions to align with our words? Right. And right. Um, are we committed to the process? So I love it. You know, one one thing I wanted to ask you as well, and I wanted to share this and get your perspective on this. I think the yeah. audience will enjoy it around readiness. Let's talk about the word trust for a second. Hmm. 
Nika, I have been uh, introduced into some what I call low trust environments. Yes. And, and, and now let me just put it this way, low trust environment. And sometimes people will say we have a DEI problem. You've heard, you know, we got a DEI problem. But if you start assessing and investigating, you recognize there's some things at a surface level, but there's some trust down here that was violated that if we don't deal with that, we're never going to take care of DE and I. Have you seen that? Yes. And what I like to refer to that as in order for you to be able to effectively be on this journey towards really addressing at a high level DEI body of work, yeah. you may need to go back and course correct on some issues that require healing and reconciliation within the organization. That's no one is going to hear you <laughs> about any type of commitment towards a sense of belonging and inclusion and opportunity for all when this is sitting out there that is continuing to loom over people's heads and get into their psyche and their mindset and impact how in which they're showing up and their level of productivity. So you're right. Part of this work is also sometimes the healing and reconciliation work before you really can do the DEI work. I told somebody recently, I said, you have team members here who have unhealed wounds and yeah. they're walking around with their unhealed wounds. And again, you're not paying attention to it. Yes. And then yes. they said, our team doesn't want to do DEI work. I said, this is not about the DEI work. There's no. stuff that precedes this, that if you don't address that, this will never get addressed. So I, I love what you say there. That's exactly yeah. So many people don't realize that the role of DEI, it takes you into so many other areas. You know, my doctorate is in leadership and organizational um, effectiveness. And it, it was for that purpose that I very specifically picked that because a lot of what we do in this space, it is about organizational effectiveness. It is about helping people to, from a leadership perspective, understand what that means and what that looks like in practice. Yeah. And, and again, being inclusion minded is a leadership competency. It is a leadership function. Yeah. And so I often say that I'm not referring to leadership by position or title, but by influence, which means that everyone should be able to gravitate towards what level of influence do I have in whatever environments where I dwell and how can I leverage that as power, you know? Mm, mm, mm. I love it. So I want to introduce another um, question for a poll question for our audience. Um, so what do you think your organization's DEI efforts are? And so if you would go to the poll and um, cast your responses, um, would love to be able to hear your thoughts on that. Um, and the options are they are performative, they are authentic, they are somewhere in the middle, and there are no DEI efforts in my organization. So it's non-existent. Just curious to hear about those who are connected to this um, community around that question. So Charles, I want to go to another question. And by the way, as I continue to engage with Charles today, we love to make sure that we're bringing in questions from the audience. A couple have already come in. Um, my team is actually curating those questions and placing them in the backstage chat. So we'll, we'll get to those in just a moment, but continue to get those questions in. So, Charles, can you give examples of what leaders um, are using, how they're using their influence to drive DEI work and what that looks like? Absolutely. I'll, I'll give two examples here. The, the first example is a situation where, Nika, you know, I do some work with some boards, both corporate boards and nonprofit boards. And there was some work necessary um, around creating an equity statement. They want to create an equity statement. Mm -hmm. And senior leadership team created this phenomenal equity statement. They say it's not just a statement. We are now going to change our practices and so on to align with this. And, and their board pushed back on that and said that that is too radical. That's the term they use. They said it's too radical. We're not going to do this. Uh, we may end up losing some of our stakeholders and so on. Uh, the CEO and their leadership team believed in this so much that they said if this equity statement was not published and put out there, they would all resign. Wow. Now you talk about influence. The, 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 the influence. Yeah, I love it. You know, they, you know, and, and when I talked to the CEO, he said, listen, I know I have a seat of privilege. I know I have a position of influence. And he goes, and I was he goes, I don't use it. He goes, but this was a time where I had to make a decision and I took a risk. He took yeah. a risk, but it worked out because the board said to him after said, we didn't realize this was that important to you. He said this should be that important to all of us. And this really blew my mind. He said to his board members, and if this is not that important to you, you need to question why you're on this board. What? I so love that. I so that is that is bold leadership, and we need so much more of it. We need so much more of it. You know, choosing courage over comfort is so necessary these days if you really want to make a difference in this space. I love that example. Did I hear you? I think you said you had two. Is there another one you want to share? Yeah. And the other example is a team that was doing some work around DE and I. This was a supervisor, a mid-level manager, and, and the supervisor. What they did, their influence, they they became vulnerable. I use that word vulnerable. They put themselves out there and they talked about the mistakes that they had made. They talked about the lessons that they had learned. They talked about some things that they said in the past that they knew were not right now. 
And they, you know, the team was emotional. It was challenging. But they said to the leader at that point in time, thank you for being authentic and being open with us. And that began to build relationships and strengthen the bond between that leader and their team because the leader didn't stand up there and say, well, you take this course on DE&I or something without me and go figure it out. They said, I know we need this because I myself have some work I need to do. And my goodness, by saying that, nobody could hide behind saying we got it. Everybody knew they had work to do. I love that. So vulnerability, authenticity, those are really important traits from a leadership perspective. I mean, just in general, just people. But when you think about leaders giving themselves permission to be forthcoming with that information, imagine what that does to, to the others in the organization. It also gives them the ability to not feel like, you know, they have to have it all figured out. And I think there's something incredibly powerful about a leader just saying, you know what, we're, we are, we're figuring this out together. But I will tell you this, I am committed to it. I am committed to learning. I am committed to understanding, deepening my commitment. So I, I, think, that's, I think that's great. So I'm going to ask, go ahead. Well, I, I, I say real quick, we, we use this term leadership effectiveness, put those two together. And the way we define leadership effectiveness is the successful use of influence, your word there, the successful use of influence to produce a desired or intended result. Love it. So, so, so here's, here's the point. Remember earlier you asked about the policies and the manuals and, the yes. procedures and so on. When I see DEI work that gets stuck in a rut, where growth is not happening, where, chain, where we're just kind of in this Groundhog Day scenario, it's never a lack of policies. It's never a lack of processes. It's never a lack of a statement. It's a lack of leadership. Yeah. Leadership fills the void between where we are and where we want to go in this DEI work. I love that. And I would say that part of that leadership void is um, not necessarily holding true to the accountability metrics that need to be in place. Yes. You know, what gets measured and tracked gets done. The people who are held accountable, they deliver. Yep. And that has to start with leadership setting that expectation and following through on it, not just in word and sentiments, you know, where we're, this is our expectation. If it's really a truly an expectation, then what mechanisms do you have in place to make sure that it is being done? That's so right. that accountability is critical. Absolutely. I'm with you 100 percent. Yeah. So I want to go to some of the responses we're seeing and the question about what do you think your organization's DEI efforts are? And we have 53 percent of this audience that says they are somewhere in the middle. Mm -hmm. And um, behind it would be 29 percent of this community says um, that they believe their organization's DEI efforts are performative. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, not, not, not surprising how, how that's shaking out. So I want to ask you a question that's the adverse effect of really what I just mentioned. So can you give examples of leaders using their influence to stop the work, derail the work, hinder the work? Because we see that a lot too, right? <laughs> yes, yes, yes. Uh, several examples. Uh, there, is the, there is the donor that approaches the nonprofit and says that if you make a statement after the George Floyd murder, I will withdraw my money from you. Yeah. 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 And you yeah. know what? There were so many organizations that were afraid to make a statement yeah. simply because that, that was very top of mind for them. We're going to lose some donors. Lose some donors. We're going to lose, donors. <sighs> we're gonna um, lose funders. Yeah. Yeah. We're going to upset these members, these stakeholders. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. There, there is the there. This one right here just hurts my heart. There is the executive director who they do a survey of their staff, a climate survey, a culture survey, a DI survey, call it what you want. Do a survey of their staff that comes back with, you know, basically this, we have some problems. We've got to work on it. And the director decides I'm going to bury the survey. I'm not going to, we don't want to talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, you know, that is, that is so good. Our experiences are so aligned. Um, one of the things that I always tell clients when we're on this journey of gathering, you know, the, the, the data collection for assessments, climate assessments is that, I want them to know on the front end, we cannot be afraid of the data. The data is the data. Don't classify it as right or wrong, good or bad. Classify it as data to baseline where we are and yeah. let that inform where we want to go. Let's yeah. see this as an opportunity. And mm -hmm. I am big on transparency. I think that we, do, especially when you are engaging people into the process where you're asking them to be vulnerable, to be transparent, to share their lived experiences. How yeah. are we not going to, you know, owe them the respect and the courtesy of helping them to understand this is what came out of this. And now here's what we're doing about it. Nika, I, I have, again, we as professionals in this field, our credibility is part of our work. And, right. and, and people trust us, right? Yes. And, and I, I've been in situations, I know you have, where we talk about a toxic environment. I've seen situations where the staff are almost like in prison, where they're like, please help me, Charles. Please. I mean, I'm I mean, they're like, please help us. 
And so just imagine doing that, and the leaders want to say that they really have authentic uh, um, a will to do something different. Then the data is not what they want to hear, and they derail the project. Yeah. Staff yeah. is like, yeah. you know, like this staff yeah. leave, they start to walk away, they start to disconnect and disengage. We got to recognize that we can use influence to do a lot of different things with it. Let's do something for the good of the mission and the people we work with. Right. And, you know, sometimes it's couched as, well, let's just share an executive summary. And what we like to do is say, OK, there's value into you know, synchronizing this information. We can share an executive summary, but we also want to share the full report so that people also, if they want to, will have the ability to read the full report as well. Yep. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, again, I, I love the fact that so many people are interested in this space and this discipline. And um, I, I, I love that. Mm -hmm. But I also go back to what we said earlier. Sometimes I think that it's just perceived as, as you know, we all are, are just helping people to kind of love each other and get along. And there's, there's a lot more to it. Um, so anyway. OK, so um, we have a lot of questions that have come from the audience. So I want to turn now. I, although I have a few more, I, I won't take up all of the time. I do want to bring our audience questions into the, um, the conversation. And so this first one comes from Jesse. And the question is, any suggestions for those who are not consultants in building organizational readiness? Absolutely. So, 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 so okay, okay. if you are, you are an organization and you want to build organizational readiness, it's going to be about relationships. So one of the things that, see, you have kind of that bird's eye view, right? You're inside already. So one of the things that you can do is internally, you can begin to do your own conversations and assessments. And right you can begin to find your own champions to help with this right here. Internally, why, you, you've heard of a SWOT analysis. I mean, the folks know what that is, right? Watch this, here's an example. Do a DE&I SWOT analysis of your organization if you wanna talk about readiness. When, just, just when it comes to DE&I, what are our organizational strengths? Yes. What are our organizational weaknesses? What opportunities exist right now for us as an organization when it comes to DE&I? And what could threaten the advancement of DE&I in this organization? If you do a DEI centric SWAT in your organization, that could give you a picture of where you are when it comes to readiness. Yeah, I agree. I think another thing that I would add to it is is data. You know, sometimes we feel like we have to have these, you know, statisticians to come in and, and pull all this data and analyze it. But sometimes let's just look at the data that you already have at your disposal internally yeah. and let that tell the story. Data really has a strong narrative and that will give you at least a glimpse of where you currently are. And, yep. and data could be just looking at across your workforce, um, you know, how many professionals of color or a part of some of the other underrepresented demographics or a part of your workforce. And at what levels are they in, within your workforce? You know, sometimes we forget that we have to also think about the upward mobility um, impact that we are creating for, for people that are part of those underrepresented. I like to say, um, you know, under underserved communities. Um, underestimated, you know, individuals. And so I think that that goes that goes um, to to that question as well. But I appreciate the question, Jesse, because I realize that sometimes um, it can appear as though maybe a lot of the strategies that practitioners talk about are only for those big organizations that have really deep pockets. And that's not always the case. I think that every organization, whether you're a startup with a few employees or whether you're a big organization, we see it all. We see it all. People are at different spectrums of the continuum of diversity, equity, and inclusion. Nika, Nika, can I talk about culture for a second there? Please talk about culture, Charles. I, I know we haven't used that word yet today, but I think also part of assessing it is just think about what your organizational culture currently is. You don't. You, I don't think we need to go back and read a statement to figure out the culture. Just pay attention. Just, just, just right, right. Just, just pay attention. <laughs> Attention. Just pay attention, right? Be you, mindful, yeah. There's that, that right said that workplace mindfulness, right? Mm -hmm. In this thing, when I think of culture, like think about the stories that we tell here. Yeah. Think, think, think about the expectations that we have here. Think about the things that reward that we reward and the things that we punish. Think about the things that we excuse and the things that we don't. Think, think I mean, culture sh surfaces in so many different ways, and it's a narrative. What's the story we tell ourselves about ourselves yes. that also can give you an insight to how ready we are? Oh, absolutely. That's great. So good. Okay, this next question is from Marcel. Hi, Marcel. Thanks for joining. Uh, Marcel's question is, I'm curious how you all go about that process of rebuilding trust as DEI practitioners. Yeah, you brought trust into the conversation. It was such um, good nuggets there. So how do you rebuild trust? I, 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 there's an author by the name of Stephen M. R. Covey. I don't know if anybody's familiar. Oh, yeah. Uh-huh. 
Speed of Trust is a book that he wrote years ago. His dad was Stephen Covey, The Seven Habits of Highly Effective People. Highly Effective People, yep. Yeah, so his son wrote a book called The Speed of Trust. And, and here's the trust formula that he talks about in that book. He says, trust equals confidence. So when we say we trust each other, for instance, in the workplace, we're saying I have I have confidence in Nika. Quite frankly, I'm on this call today because when Nika called me, no question, I have confidence in her. I trust her. See, we, we define trust at a superficial level. I trust you won't steal my phone. That's not what we're talking about. We're not talking about somebody going in your purse or your wallet. Confident, but confidence, we only have confidence in those people or organizations that we view as credible. Mm-hmm. And here's the work. Here's the work. Credibility consists of a few things, but the two most important are competency and character. Yeah. So we demonstrate the competency and the character. People view us as credible. They have confidence in us, and now they trust us. So leaders, here's your job is. Your job is to demonstrate the competency and the character consistent with your position. Now, especially in this DEI work, warning, sometimes you got to restore trust that you did not break. You weren't even there when it happened, but now you got to restore it. And you're not going to make people trust you. So what do you do? You demonstrate competency and character. And remember, this DEI work, there's a continuum. And people at a different place in that continuum, and they move at their own pace. But if you try to pull them, they'll run away. Demonstrate competency and character and give people a space to begin to trust you. That's You just said restore trust. You may have to restore trust you did not break. Yes, ma'am. I love that because you know what? I am working with some clients now that are, are, are new leaders, new C-suite leaders. Yep. And part of the toxicity of the organization is because of prior leaders. Yep. And they almost feel like, well, you know, that's the history here. Yep. So, yeah, but what are you going to do about it? Because now you're in that leadership seat. <laughs> That's exactly right. And so watch this. And so the first thing I do, if if I'm in that situation, I acknowledge that they have been hurt. I acknowledge that there's been trauma. I I acknowledge, watch this, I acknowledge their reality. Yes. Well, that ain't me. That ain't my problem. No, you're now magnifying the the distrust. I I acknowledge that. However, for you and I, for you and I, how are we going to grow together? Nika, you know that old diagram around development, around forming, storming, norming, and performing, right? Folks yes. know those, right? That's, part, that's part of the relationship development. Yeah. So I, I advise everybody, look at the model of forming, storming, norming, and performing. There's many others, but that relationship development, that forming stage is really critical, really critical to help you recognize the path to go to get to performance. You don't just jump into performance. You got to start at forming. Yeah. This is so good, Charles. I'm, I'm hating to see the time kind of wind down. Okay, so this next question is from Sophie Bells. Hi, Sophie. Thanks for joining us. And I think I saw on the chat where today maybe is your birthday. So happy birthday, Sophie. Um, so her question is, I would love to know how you both as DEI practitioners differentiate or separate how you advocate for DEI in your professional life compared to your personal life. That's a good question, Sophie. Why don't you take that first, Charles? Because it gives me a chance to think about my answer. <laughs> Look, I'm being vulnerable and real right now. <laughs> oh my goodness! So thank you for that question, it is it is everything to me. It it it, it is my, it is my everything, and I love the words that you use. Advocate, I, I advocate across the board all the time, twenty four seven, wherever I am. I, I like to think that I live life with what I call an equitable lens. Mm-hmm. I'm in the grocery store or the gas station walking my dog or riding my bike at the YMCA. It's not that I'm looking for problems or trouble. I'm looking for opportunities for us as leaders to demonstrate and create that space for understanding that we talked about earlier. So yeah. I, don't, I don't separate the two. It's, it's who I am. I want to be very clear about this. This work is more who I am than what I do. Yeah. It's yeah. I do. And then the other thing I'll say as well, I feel that as a parent, part of my responsibility, this is how I view parenthood, I gave my children, I gave the world my children. I gave mm-hmm. my children. And so part of me modeling as well is teaching my children when they're in spaces. I have two college students right now, and they call me up and have conversations. Hey, Dad, this happened, but I did this. And as a parent right there, I don't ever have to do this work again. They get it. Right. My kids get it, and they're promoting it and pushing it and creating inclusive environments, and that's what I consider my gift to the world. 
Yeah, Charles, you're modeling it. And I think that's so important for us. Let's take outside, you know, the, the notion of being maybe professionals in our workplaces, but we're also moms and aunts and neighbors and, you know, community members. I mean, so are we modeling this work? You're right. I mentioned earlier that this work begins at the personal level. So I'm with you. I think that the two, they have to intertwine. It's not, you know, who you are in one setting and that and you turn that off when you walk into another setting. It's really who you are. And that's why for me, I always think that it's critically important. And when we do our new hires, we have these deep conversations about what is your story in terms of why you want to be in this space. That story is so important to me. I have to know that it's more to you than just having a job, right? You have to also share in some of the convictions that we hold very, um, very significant to our as a part of our core values. And so, yeah, when I think about our core values from an NWC perspective, those are also things that we are encouraging our clients to adopt as well. We talk about integrity. We have high level of integrity of the data. Why? Because we are after results, which means that we want to make sure that we're extending ourselves in a way that leads to that rapport and trust as people are sharing their stories, their lived experiences with us. One of our key values is um, courage. You know, we have to choose courage over comfort. I'm not going to ask you to do it as my clients and not do it myself. So that means even when I'm having conversations with you as a client, I sometimes am taking risk in saying this may not be a perspective that you want to hear, but I think it's for your good based upon what you based upon you saying that you want to lead and not align or lag. <laughs> right. Uh, you know, you know, Nika, to that point, you just reminded me of something on social media that that's also part of our personal lives and professional lives. Right. Yes. And, so as an example, I had somebody say to me, I see that such and such is a co as a friend of yours on social media. I said, yeah, we connect on social media. They said, but do you know he believes so? And so I said, I know, I know him. I said, I know him very well. I said, but he's respectful on my timeline. Mm -hmm. I, I, I feel that I cannot put myself in an echo chamber or bubble and just have people in my social media world that just think what I think. No, oh, exactly. I, You're preaching to the choir otherwise. Exactly. Right? I have a diversity of people who don't agree on a lot of different things. We have to model that. We have to show people that, especially in this hypercharged environment right now, we can engage in space with people who see the world differently without it being toxic. We got to model that. Yeah, that's so true. You know, there's so many people that are entering this conversation at different places. And, and quite honestly, we're going to have to extend grace and accept grace if really our ultimate goal is for us to all emerge stronger. We can't attack people, guilt, shame and blame them. We have to help bring them along. You know, and I'm not saying that that means be dismissive about the accountability factor, but I'm saying that we do have to be mindful of people are at different places, you know. Right. That's right. La last thing I'll say that because it's kind of interesting. I had somebody say something after the election on my on my, on my Facebook feed and uh, I sent him a message. I said, I'm giving you one chance. I said, you know, I said, don't, I don't do nonsense on my page. People that know me know I don't do the nonsense. You don't have to agree, but none of that nonsense. And he apologized because I don't want anybody to be caused harm by anything on my feed. Yeah, that's good. That's good. So um, this next question is from Charlene Jones. Thanks for your question, Charlene. What do you recommend to the person that is wanting to become a DEI practitioner? So is there anything new and different you would share based upon what we've already kind of touched on? Uh, the other thing, only thing I'd add is know your why. You know, really, really, really know, know, know your why. Really, you know, don't, if it's a job, I get a job. I get we need to make money and so on. But the why has to be deeper than that. Yeah, yeah. To know your why. No, you're right. No, that's good. I love that. One thing that I will add to it is um, is empathy. Empathy. Um, we have someone. We, we're really big on strength finders on our team. Gallup strength finders. This has been a great tool for us. Mm -hmm. um, and we have someone on our team that is like number one as an empath. Mm -hmm. And what I am finding is that it makes her so much more of an astute practitioner just because of her level of ability to connect with people and be people centric and people focused. People tend to trust her. Um, and it's, and I, I've seen it. I've seen it just work to her favor. And so anyway, I just I thought I'd amplify that as well. Yeah, I'm, I'm an empath, by the way. So I oh, good. Fantastic. Yeah. yeah. And, and I often my team laughs at me. I often have to remind them, OK, I'm a maximizer. I'm not an empath. I don't think empath is even in my top 30, 34. And there's only 34. <laughs> but, but I'm a maximizer. So I love the fact that I can surround myself with people that they have that really strong because it balances us out. I am like, I'm a maximizer. I'm a finisher. I want to get it done. I'm about impact, not activity, you know? And so we need to have all those other skill sets as well. So anyway, shout out to Natasha because she, she probably knows I was talking about her. She is our team impact. <laughs> uh, okay, so Mauricio has a question. How do you deal with managers or directors who refuse to be authentic? In their mind, they feel that they must show leadership by always being right 
or by always knowing everything. Mm-hmm. Can you teach someone that? Can you teach someone how to be authentic? If, if, watch this. If they're willing and teachable. Oh, that's true. That's the best <laughs> answer. I mean, I mean, Nika, I've had situations. Have you ever had the situation? I've had it where I've had to say that person ain't changing. They, they're just not they because they don't want they don't want to. They're, they're not going to change. So at some point, you got to ask yourself the question. Can I be here? Because that person is not going to change. OK, Charles, that is so good. That is so good. Um, You know, so. There are so many people who have different mental models about this work of DEI. You know, you have some that are all in, you have some that are passive and they believe it's important, but they see it as responsibility of someone else. I mean, all these different mental models. I wrote a blog about it recently. Uh But the one thing that I often tell people, and I grapple with this, you know, there's certain populations of people that I, I don't mind if they're not fully woke, quote unquote, but if they are again, willing to be teachable and to engage, I'm all there for you. But those who have demonstrated time and time again, you know, Maya Angelou says, when people show you who they are, believe them. So for those individuals who have demonstrated time and time again that this is where they are, they're in this box, they're not moving out of this box, I don't find it prudent to extend energy and time and trying to change their mind. I would rather work on the larger population of people that I think at least have a chance to help us emerge stronger and put my time and energy there. It's a distraction, Nika. I'm telling you, it's a distraction. When somebody starts a conversation with Charles, how do I make? I say, stop right there. Don't even finish. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You're not going to make anybody do anything. Stop right there. I'm sorry. You're not going to make anybody yeah. do anything. Now, before we write somebody off, so to speak, I'm going to have a conversation. I right. always want to create that space for understanding. Always want to. Because sometimes that's a symptom of something else going on. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. So here's the deal. This is why it's important for organizations to internally be connected because I've seen a manager or a supervisor at some level who's causing harm to their team, but the senior leadership team is totally unaware of it. We yeah. got, we got to make sure as organization. Here's your organizational effectiveness part right here. Make sure as an organization we have the systems and structure in place where our staff cannot be damaged by one person and nobody knows about it. But sometimes they are aware of it. They meaning leadership and they tolerate it. I saw a meme the other day and it was, I'm paraphrasing here, but something to the effect of nothing will destroy a good employee more than seeing their employer tolerate a bad employee. Ooh, I love you know, it. Sometimes yeah. they know it and they will just kind of close their, uh, like, turn a blind eye to it. And so, yeah, but well, I guess. I'll say real quick, I know we got to go, but just no, that's, why, that's why the relationships in my, watch this, I'm going to be controversial. Relationships are more important than results. And what I mean by that is we'll take, I work with some sales organizations. If somebody's a high performing salesperson, it's hard to let that person go. And they can be a toxic, so we call them toxic geniuses. They're yeah. great at what they do, but they're toxic and destroying the environment because they're making us money as an example. Yes. They're making us money. Yeah, but look at what they're doing. What we found is when you value your people and they know you see here and value them, you said that, and relationships are strong. Results are a re- results are a result of strong relationships. There you go. Right, and strong relationships will get you results. They sure will. They sure okay, will. so Kyra has a question. Would you take on a client whose primary motivation is compliance? Is it possible to transform this into more meaningful change strategy down the road? If yes, how and when would you introduce this new level? Great question, Kyra. Thank you. Thank you, Kyra, for the question. So for me, Nika, that's not my work. I would not take that client on. Mm-hmm. I, I would not. Um, because usually what happens, because I've had this happen in the past. If, if somebody is thinking about compliance, they had an EEO complaint, there's somebody filed a lawsuit, and they're trying to just dot and I a check a box for legal purposes. For, for folks like that, I tell them to call an attorney if they want to. And, and th- that's all about make sure my policy manual is at its legal minimum to keep, protect us. That's what they want. That's not my profile of the person I work with. No, I agree. I, I, I stand by that. Again, you, you have to know. And there are some organizations, I'm sure, that do a great job in, in that being their space. But I'm with you. That's that's not part of our client roster either. Mm-mm. Um, OK, so I wanted to go to another question that I had on my list. What is your take on organizations hiring a chief diversity officer to fix the problem? Uh Based on that statement, the way they frame that, I don't like that because the chief diversity officer is set up for failure in more cases than not is what I see. Yeah, and they're not the sole owner of the DEI work. People have to realize that too. They think that if I just hire this person, everything else is going to fall into place. Yes, they're going to add to it, but everybody has to own this. We bring that person in, they're going to save us, and everybody else walks away from it and leaves that person on an island by themselves. 
Absolutely not. I believe in CDOs. I believe Chief Dirt, that's a valuable position, but we cannot think that person alone by themselves are going to do it. And, 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 and let me just say this as well. You talked earlier about you know that increase in the C-suite. I love the fact that there are more chief diversity officers, but what I want to see, what I'm really going to impress is when there are more CEOs, CFOs, and CIOs that are people of color, women, indigenous, Latinx, and so on. That's what I want to see. Yes. Yes, absolutely. I love that. Absolutely. Okay, so Marcel has another question. As DEI practitioners, how do you both work to address workplace trauma? It's hard for employees to feel comfortable being vulnerable when being vulnerable often gets people burned. Mm. Yeah, workplace trauma. Yeah. So, so one of the first things I do is I have to help people recognize we, we do a lot of coaching like you do, Nika, as well. And there's a difference, folks. Remember that there's a difference between coaching and counseling. Oh, yeah. Yeah. So so unpack that for this audience, though. Coaching and counseling. Unpack that quickly. So, so re really quick. So, so so coaching is more from a strength base moving forward. Counseling, there's a wound, something I'm still dealing with and usually good. reflecting in the past. Just it's good. Right there. Right there. And if some, and what I tell people, counseling is above my pay grade. If I, <laughs> you need a therapist if you want counseling. If you want coaching, go to Charles. But, but if, it's a, if it's a counseling situation, I refer, I find support for them, but that's one way that trauma is that deep. They need help with that, that I may not be able to provide. And I acknowledge that. Yeah. I don't play people's yeah. mental health. No, that's good. I, I'm, I'm the same way. Okay. So Jesse has a question. What about companies that put the work on a council, like a DEI council or committee, and yeah. these individuals have full-time jobs mm -hmm. and they're not given resources or any type of extra compensation for the time that they're, you know, how do you feel about that? Then it's not a council, it's an unpaid mandate. <laughs> yeah, uh, it's not a council. Yeah. If it's a real council, number one, they do it during work hours. They're compensated for the work. They have the resources to support them in their work. Watch this. They have the autonomy to make decisions. Yes, okay. give them power yeah. and authority. Give them some authority. Then it's a council. If it's not that, it's just a nice meeting. It's just a nice meeting. I love that. There's so much synergy here. I, I again, I'm hating seeing the time wind down. Um, okay, let's see. So. I want to get one more question in, and this is kind of a two-part question, but we're going to do this anyway. So I know that you work with a lot of boards, and we've talked about that a little bit today, but I want you to give me maybe the top one to two missteps of boards that compromise the work of um, diversity and inclusion. Uh, first misstep is the board not being on one accord. Yes. Yeah. Number one, the, making the assumption that everybody agrees on the direction that they're going in. Mm -hmm. uh, the second misstep is that since the board is not on one accord, the CEO is receiving 17 different directives from 17 different board members. And sure. that creates a lot of confusion for that CEO. Uh, the third, but really quick to add to it, the third misstep in here is that the board is not aligning with the vision, mission, and values of the organization. When boards have tough decisions to make, they should make those decisions based on the vision, mission, and values, not who's allowed us in the room, who's been around the longest, who do I like. Vision, mission, and values should frame this work, and I believe DEI fits within that framework. I love that. Charles, I could sit here and talk to you all day. One last question for you. Uh -huh. What have I not asked you about today or what have we not had a chance to touch on today that you're having some passion and energy around that you want this audience to know? Love, love. What I want, I, I am, Nika, I'm in a space where I am bringing leadership and love together. I love I, I, I'm in a space right now where if we don't bring the heart into our leadership practice, practice, stop leading. Our people need more than directives and authority. They need to be seen, heard, and valued, as you said. They need to be loved and know that. So leadership and love are not mutually exclusive. They go hand in hand. Love the people or don't even attempt to lead them. Yeah. So I know we've been very present into this conversation, but I do hope that you'll take a moment to read back through the, the chat um, because lots of great um, information that you've shared has been resonating with this audience. I could sit here and talk to you all day, Charles. I mean, this has been such a rich conversation. I learn something every time I, I am in your presence and I appreciate that. I appreciate your partnership and support of me and my work. And I, I think that you, you're just incredible. So I'm so glad that you accepted our invite and um, that this community has had a chance to kind of hear from you. So how can people find you and reach out to you? And of course, we'll include this in the follow-up email as well. Thank you so much. Across all platforms, Charles Weathers, uh, Twitter, Facebook, LinkedIn, and so on, theweathersgroup.com, weathersgroup.com. You can find us there as well. And, and Nika, thank you so much for your work. Congratulations on your four years anniversary. You are making a difference. You are doing some phenomenal things. And I'm just glad to call you friends.
Oh, thank you so much, Charles. So, so thank you for amplifying that. We did just February 1 reach our fourth year anniversary. And so we're super excited about that as a firm and um, excited just to see the growth and the opportunities to connect and have the privilege of working with so many great individuals and organizations. And so we're grateful to reach yay four. So <laughs> thank you so much to this audience. Appreciate your time, your engagement, um, your questions, and, and just the, the, the chatter that you have um, contributed to today's conversation. Be sure to join us next Friday for Intentional Conversations podcast, where again, as I mentioned at the start of the hour, we're going to be welcoming Joe Gerstad, and it's going to be another rich conversation. And so we appreciate your time. And I'm going to give you a call to action today. There was so much that was shared in this hour. I mean, really, we, we need to spend time going back and reflecting, well, revisiting all of the great content. Don't just keep this to yourself. Pull some key team members together and have you all watch it together and then talk about what's coming up for you, what's resonating, what are some things we can implement immediately. Don't let this be a moment. That is an activity. Let this be something that is going to lead towards impact. And so that's your call to action. I look forward to seeing you all um, next week. Thanks again, Charles. We appreciate you. Bye-bye, everybody. Thank you. Bye.